Welcome to the Focus and Chill podcast, where we discuss productivity tactics that work for neurodiverse individuals. Every episode, we interview guests with lived experience of neurodiversity who also have a solid productivity and habit game, and pass the learnings on to you, our wise and benevolent audience. We're your hosts, Jeremy and Joey. I'm Joey, and I coach creatives to get moving on their most ambitious projects through the power of solid habits and strong focus. I'm also a perpetual student of psychology and perpetually on a quest to a one-armed chin-up. And I'm Jeremy, a neurospicy software developer turned startup founder, building the Focus Bear app to help people with ADHD and autism thrive at work. My cool party trick is leaving parties early so I can get to sleep in time for my two hour long morning routine. The Focus and Chill podcast is brought to you by Focus Bear, a habit and productivity app that makes healthy habits and deep work the path of least resistance. If you have a tendency to check emails or scroll through Instagram first thing in the morning, but long to develop a meditation and exercise habit first thing, Focus Bear can help you. The app blocks distractions on all your devices and guides you through your habits one at a time. Throughout the day, Focus Bear assists you to stay in deep work by blocking websites and apps that are unrelated to your chosen focus mode. Life's not all about work though. You'll be prompted to take regular breaks to rest your eyes and stretch your muscles. At the end of the day, Focus Bear helps you switch off. Work-related apps get hidden so you can unwind and sleep well. Check out the app by going to focusbear.io. Welcome to episode number 39 of the Focus and Chill podcast. It's just Joey and I today, which is perfect because we've got a packed agenda to talk about. We're going to start by discussing hyperbolic discounting. Then we'll go through avoiding motivation crowding out. I'm going to talk about my low-information diet and we'll close it off with how we do regular reviews in various areas of our life. Let's begin with hyperbolic discounting. Can you explain what that is, Joey? Yeah, it's hyperbolic discounting relates to the brain's tendency to uh, discount rewards that are further out into the future. Um, so the, fur- the further out into the future you go, the more um, your brain basically views those rewards as intangible and less concrete. Whereas um, the same reward that is like that, that you'll be able to have right now or tomorrow is seen as more tangible, more concrete, more valuable. And so it means that we often favor instant gratification over, over the, the, the gratification. Uh, like the, deferred gratification. Exactly. Yeah. Thank like you. The marshmallow so, test. Is that an example of it? It is an example of it. Um, I've heard that marshmallow test has uh, come under some very uh, serious scrutiny around, like um, it not taking into account various inequalities and 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 what have you. Um, but the the general the general idea is there, which is if you if you're able to actually no, let, let, let's scrap that because I'm not sure if the general idea is there because they they basically found that um, the initial the initial finding was that adults that were able to defer gratification um, in not eating a marshmallow that was put in front of them, sorry, children that were able to defer gratification of not eating a marshmallow that was put in front of them ended up being able to live more successful lives on various measures. Now, the, the hard thing about that or the um, what that seemed to confound was that a kid that comes from a lower socioeconomic um, background might actually be hungry. Uh, be hungry, exactly, or um, might not have the benefit of a nutritious diet uh, or like have that education, and so they might just say like, because because their parents maybe it's all they can afford is like the, this this junk food and stuff to, to appease the kid, like um, the, the kid is just like going oh marshmallow or oh I'm hungry. And so it's got that, it's got that, um, I guess, is it, is it actually differentiating between the ability to d- delay gratification or is it actually just differentiate, differentiating between different classes? And so um, there, there is a, a little bit of a confound there, but anyway, sorry, that's a bit of an aside. Um, the, the idea is that, yeah, like if you're able to delay gratification, then you are able to pursue longer term goals one of the things that I found in myself is that being willing to, for example, forego a piece of chocolate that is in front of me means that I can basically say like, okay, well, don't eat that chocolate until you've done your workout. And then 
I get the enjoyment of a workout, like a, of a of a really nice hard workout. I get the natural endorphins that come from it. I also get the anticipation of the chocolate, of the reward as well. So by not immediately giving into my 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 present desires, I get a double whammy later on. Uh, and it leads to a more satisfying life. Whereas if you just eat the chocolate, you get all the dopamine hits and you're just like, well, why do I even need to exercise? Like, well, I'm just like, just feeling good with this chocolate in my mouth. So yeah, um, I'm not sure if I really illustrated it clearly, Jess. Uh, could you ask me like, if there's anything to clarify? Yeah, mate, what are some other examples of where people would discount future awards? I mean, mm. potentially saving ret for retirement is probably one that comes up where, if you have the choice between having a hundred dollars now versus a hundred dollars to your future self, the temptation is probably, or not a hundred dollars for your future self, maybe $500 for your 70 year old self, if you were to invest it. And like what you were saying, it, it feels so intangible that yeah. we have to set up systems so that people actually don't have a choice that in Australia, your money goes into superannuation because yes. the government has recognized that people suck at, at <laughs> saving for retirement. And so we actually need a system to force them to save. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The, the money one is such a great one, right? Because I think um, when it, when it comes to money and, and spending in essence, the, the goalposts can kind of change a little bit. So Let's say you're just out of school and you don't have a car and you just think to yourself, oh, if only I could have like some car that just like gets me from A to B. So you get like a, a 20 year old Toyota Corolla or something like that. Not bashing Toyota Corollas, very solid car. And, and you get it and you're satisfied. And it's it's amazing that you got this thing that gets you from A to B. But then pretty soon you see like your, your friends um, and they've got slightly nicer cars. Maybe they've got um, a late model Corolla or maybe... Um, some some nicer car and then it's just like you want that car and then you get that for a little while and then that that wears off so it's um that i guess that's more the hedonic treadmill but i guess it's a similar concept in that if you learn to i guess live with less so if your if your norm becomes like muesli for breakfast every day then the day where you can have waffles is like a massive tree right um I don't know. It's more, a waffle's more expensive than than muesli. I can't remember. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> Depends what type of muesli you're buying. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was just thinking that. Um, I think Carmen's is actually quite expensive, but um, and we're not. We don't endorse Carmen's. We they're not a sponsor. Though, if you want, if you want to sponsor us, <laughs> I think we're, I think we're, um, we're okay with that. Um, but yeah. So when when it comes to, in terms of hyperbolic discounting, it's it's a bit like okay, well. If I keep discounting the the future, the future, and keep spending now, then that increases my baseline, which means that I save less later on. Which means that it's the amount I need to get to in order to, let's say, leave working full time. That keeps on getting pushed further and further out as well. And so it's it's like this, yeah. It's it's this um, really. I can't think of the word other than like self-defeating, I guess, chase for for more. Whereas if you if you can get used to living within your means or even below that, and I know for some people that's like like living within your means is like really like it's it's survival. So like I'm I'm not um I'm speaking from a fairly privileged place here. But yeah, it's it's one of those things where I the more you can save, the the better it is for your future self. However, hyperbolic discounting makes that tough. Yeah. Okay. And then in terms of strategies for overcoming hyperbolic discounting, you've, yeah. you've shared the chocolate example. Mm. Do you want to elaborate on that and maybe also talk about your point system for how yeah. you, you convince yourself to do things that don't give that hit right away? Yeah, yeah, sure thing, Jess. So yeah, when when it comes to when it comes to motivating yourself towards things that are where, where you don't see the immediate payoff until later on. It can be easy to lose motivation and get discouraged when, when you don't get those immediate benefits. So it's important to reward yourself and uh, a differentiate between intrinsic rewards and, and extrinsic rewards. So intrinsic rewards are the rewards that are inherent in the tasks that you're doing. So for example, if you're exercising, you can uh, get the endorphin rush from a good a good workout 
or you might feel a lot of satisfaction from being able to get to a personal best. Let's say you were only able to do about 20 push-ups. Now you can do 21. That is intrinsically, that can be intrinsically satisfying. Then you have extrinsic rewards. And so those are rewards that they, they don't come with the activity that you're doing. So for example, it might be the case that to keep yourself motivated, you listen to a podcast that you listen to only when you exercise. And it's it's a podcast that you look forward to. And so because you bundle those two activities together, the, it's a process called temptation bundling, you bundle the workout and you bundle the, the podcast together, you actually look, start looking forward to the, to the workout. And that's the way you can get yourself to show up and to participate. Uh, the thing about some activities is that it's difficult to bundle them together. So for example, if you just trying to think of a good example. No, do, uh, swimming laps. You can't really swimming listen laps, to music we, at the same time. That's right. Good, good one, Jazz. Yeah, swimming laps is a is a good one. So how can you actually how can you actually bundle an extrinsic reward with that? And it is actually quite difficult. So what you can do instead is reward yourself after the activity, some period after the activity. It might be immediately after, or it might be some period of time after. And in order for me to uh, manage that, I developed a little bit of a point system. So for, for instance, with my workouts, I give myself two points every time I reach a personal best and I give myself one point uh, for, for completing the workout. And uh, I take away a point if I don't show up. I show up a lot. <laughs> so, um, and and those points are, I can redeem for for video games or other, other activities that are uh, not not as edif- uh, life affirming or edifying, but I look forward to nonetheless. Mm. And I guess the the concern about this approach is that it may lead to motivation crowding crowding out. That there's those studies saying that if you ask students to do a a tough puzzle and you say mm. if you solve this really fast, I'm going to pay you twenty bucks versus students who you don't give them any reward and you just say, hey, solve this puzzle. And don't even say that it might be fun. Just put the puzzle in front of them and see if they do it. Yes. And I don't know if this finding is also contentious, but my recollection of it is that basically the students who do get a financial reward, they might do it faster the first time. But as the puzzles increase in complexity, they get bored if there's no additional financial reward and they don't actually persevere with it. Whereas the students who are just given a puzzle and it's their choice whether they play with it or not, they tend to actually play with it and they tend to persevere with it for longer. Mm, mm. And the challenge I've been grappling with personally is I was often temptation bundling with activities like writing CSS when I'm Mm. doing coding activities Mm. that I have found very dull. Mm. I was finding that it actually diminishes the enjoyment of it even things like doing washing or washing the dishes doing household chores I'd always be listening to something while I was doing it to try and make it more interesting and the the concern then is that if my phone is out of batteries and I can't listen to it does that mean that I I don't then do the dishes or am I actually removing the intrinsic reward from it And it's something I continue to grapple with because I I do genuinely find it easier to do some things with the added motivation, but there are also rewards to it too, which I might talk about further with my low information diet. But uh, the the other thing would be like with the the chocolate in the workout example, does it mean that you don't enjoy the workout as much because you're only doing it so you can get chocolate and video Mm -hmm. game points? Yeah, that's that's a those are great questions, uh, and I'm, I'm not I'm not aware if there's any contention around that that uh, that study you cited. I've also heard of one about like um, kids withdrawing and gold stars and stuff. Uh, so yeah, like I guess I guess the way I the way I see it is that extrinsic rewards tend to provide you with the the fuel. So the because it's, it's difficult to to be motivated by intrinsic rewards towards a task that you've never done before or that you've got very little experience with. So the extrinsic rewards help get you over that activation energy to to start. And so hopefully when you start and you start 
um, using the extrinsic rewards to, to get you over there and to give, to build momentum, then you start feeling the intrinsic rewards of the, of the activity. And I think, I think if you, if you can time it well, and, and, the, and these, these things are, are quite difficult to time because it's difficult to know when you'll experience that hedonic dip. Because like when you first, when you, for example, if you start uh, like bundling workouts with listening to, a, a, let's say a podcast, then initially the extrinsic motivation will be maybe up here and then it will start to dip as you habituate to it. And what's great about intrinsic motivation is that it, it, like as 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 this is dipping, hopefully your intrinsic motivation is climbing, climbing, climbing like this. And so, basically, the extrinsic motivation provides you with the spark, and then the sorry, extrinsic motivation provides you with the spark to get you going. The intrinsic motivation provides you with the fuel to keep on going. And of course, there's dips in intrinsic motivation as well. And then it might be a case of selecting a new extrinsic motivator to get you out of the dip, and then and then cycling through like that. Hmm. Yeah. And it, it could also be that the requirement for a spark is less if you choose a less ambitious goal to begin with. Yes. So if it's a, a workout habit that you're developing, maybe you do need a huge amount of a reward to motivate you if you're going to be going and doing one hour of weights. But mm. if you started out with a really small workout initially and just did one push up, yeah. yeah the tiny habits example, one push up after you pee. Yeah. And then build on it from there then maybe it requires less extrinsic motivation. Yeah, that's that's a good one. Tell me more about this uh, low information digest. Like what's, uh, what brought that on? It's something that I, I think we've, we've probably talked about it in the, the past and I, I've talked about how I, I have had a tendency to, to couple coding, washing the dishes, doing chores, all of those sort of things with doing some kind of pleasurable activity at the same time, listening to a podcast, listening to an audio book. And I was realizing that it was probably actually not great for my attention span to be doing that. And I'm, I wanted to do an experiment where I've decided that for three months, I'm not going to do any of that. And I'm probably going to continue it going forward because I've found that there have been a lot of benefits to it. It feels like I'm getting a lot more mindfulness that instead of when I go for a run, instead of constantly listening to something while I run. And to be fair, I wasn't necessarily doing it the whole time. I had a rule for myself that I'd have the first 20 minutes I would run without any input. And then after that, I would listen to something. But there are other activities where I felt that I was I was using the external input as too much of a crutch. And I was starting to lose the actual enjoyment of it. And I've been trying to instead look at ways of making the activity more enjoyable. So there's some, some principles out of some ADHD literature around how to make a task that is on the surface, not particularly enjoyable, more fun. There's four C's of motivation in a book I read recently. One of them is creativity. So having something that maybe the the CSS is boring on its own, but if I can learn a new way of doing it, or if I can maybe try and rather than just making it look the way that it looked in the design, if I slightly tweak it so that it feels like I'm having some creative influence on it and I'm learning new things that can make it more fun. Also with writing unit tests, which is a, a programming thing that can be very dull. I've found that if I put in interesting test data in there. So I, I used to quite often write some unit tests that involved Donald Trump. I'm not going to say how I represented Donald Trump. You can probably guess. Just ways to, to make a task that could be quite menial into something that was more fun. And then the other four C's are captivate in terms of choosing things that are intrinsically interesting, which isn't always possible, but finding some way to make it relevant. And then challenge and compete which is similar to you with the the personal best of trying to make it faster better and I, I do find that helps especially the creativity one one of the tasks that i've been doing recently is basically writing business cases for new features that my team is building and i find that super dull and boring but i've been using chat gpt to write it for me and 
I'll give it a prompt of right, fill out this template for me, but include funny FAQs in there and make the the quote about this particular feature amusing. As an example, I had one recently, which allows people to define the time zone that a particular SMS number would be used. And it, it came up with a, a quote that made me laugh, which was the reason I built the feature, apparently, according to ChatGPT, was because I wanted to go to a kangaroo boxing match. And when I got there, it turns out there were just some fit kangaroos lying around because the date format was in US format instead of Australian format. So it was actually last month. Oh, and boo. That sort of thing does make it just genuinely more fun for me whilst still helping me to, to be in flow and get the work done. So I found that I've been enjoying those menial tasks more and also noticing that things like washing the dishes that at times in the past where I would have been listening to a podcast or an audio book, I've now got more time for mindfulness. And I found that I need to keep a piece of paper nearby because I just have tons of ideas while I'm doing those busy hands, quiet mind sort of tasks. The part that I find challenging about it is I actually was really enjoying reading paper books in the evening. So I was typically reading the last book that I was reading and that I have had to put away on the shelf for the next three months was a book by Peter Atiyah about longevity. And I felt like that was actually really beneficial for me to be absorbing that high quality, long form content, I'm not talking about looking at TikTok, but books that seem to have high information density and are relevant to my life. But I've, I've decided until, when will it be? Until November, I'm not going to read or consume anything that isn't absolutely necessary for my present needs. And maybe that's hyperbolic discounting that I'm ignoring the needs <laughs> of my future self, but I'm just trying it out for a bit to, to see what it's like to have a lot more time where I am in the moment and absorbing information from my surroundings rather than from other sources. I don't think I'll yeah. do it forever, but some of those activities like the not running with a podcast and not washing the dishes with a podcast, I think I'll carry that forward. But I do want to find a time for intentional study. I am drawing a lot of inspiration from what, what, what you're doing there, Jess, because I am really a... I'm a, a bit of an information junkie and I, yeah, I, I just love feeling all of my free time. Well, not all of my free time. I, I meditate where I'm not listening to things and I don't sleep with podcasts going and I don't shower with podcasts going. Um, so, but that's, that's probably the extent to which I don't have any content in, in my ears. Oh, and also like when I'm working on, on stuff, but I'll have music, I'll have music playing. So my my ears are under constant assault, I guess. <laughs> uh, and but that was one of the things that actually inspired me for this because I remember you shared about that a while ago that when you were doing data engineering work that instead of listening to podcasts, you would just listen to music. And that piqued my attention at the time. I didn't really feel like I could do it. That I, It's actually not been as hard as I thought. I think the first couple of days were hard as my brain rewired, but now it's been okay. And I've also, I've stopped listening to trance music. That was the other thing that I used to do a lot when I was working on something that was required a lot of attention. I've changed to, there's a Spotify playlist, calming violin music. I'm listening to that instead. Nice, nice. Yeah, I I go between that, that electronic dance music uh, and I've, there's, there's this really cool, uh, YouTube channel. I think his name is like Juan Ortiz or or something. Uh, and he does piano. He does piano instrumentals of music that you would not expect to have pia piano instrumentals. So, for example, the one that got me hooked on him is him doing about an hour or two hours of Ramstein on on the piano. Mm -hmm. And for for those of you don't don't know Ramstein. Uh, Industrial metal jazz, would, would you say? Yeah, yeah. German, German, German industrial metal. Yeah, you got to say it's German uh, to give that extra bit of gravitas. <laughs> it's not just any industrial metal; it's German industrial metal, very efficient music. So, um, it's it's that's really good. But I, I digress. Um, it's 
when when you said well, so you said you were inspired by me listening to music rather than podcasts while working uh but i it, it seems like not that it's a competition just but it seems like you've now actually surpassed me in that you're not even really listening to you're not listening to trance but you are listening to some kind of music while you work is that right yeah and I think music is fine, especially because sometimes there's background noise and I can't concentrate if there's people talking, for example, like my wife's office is opposite mine and I can hear her if she's having a loud meeting. So I think music is fine. It's beneficial. I, I do. I, I'm not listening to music while I'm running, but other times I, if I'm working on something and I need to think clearly, then I will. Yeah. Yeah. His, uh, something that I've been thinking about, which is that I very rarely listen to music out of the sheer pleasure of it anymore. So when I was a, when I was probably in my early twenties, I remember like just getting a CD because that's what, that's what was around in, in the early 20, when I was in my early twenties, I won't tell you the year, but I, yeah, would just listen to a CD from beginning to end. Like I might take a look at the liner notes I can admire the, any art that's in it or, and while I'm listening. And I, I very, I, I really do that these days. These days, music is more utilitarian for me. It's something that accompanies me while I work. And in that, I can't help but feel like I've lost something, lost some of the magic of the art form, of, list, of just listening to music. I was wondering if you, if you have any similar, any, any similar thoughts on that. Utilitarian is really the way I describe my music listening as well, and I, I do wonder about that because I, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure whether it was just peer pressure or whether I genuinely enjoyed it. But in my early twenties, I also, I mean, it's probably more the thing that I would associate with active listening is actually going to live gigs and going to music festivals. Yeah, I don't yeah. think I actually enjoy that. I, I think I find it too stimulating overall and too many crowds. I don't think I really want to do that anymore, but maybe there might be some point in the future where I'd probably enjoy going and seeing a chamber chamber orchestra performance. I did that a few times with my dad and I think I did enjoy that. Yeah, nice one. Yeah. I, I'm I'm like you, Jess. When it comes to live music, it's sometimes sometimes I just like um watch a dvd of a live performance from the comfort of my living room and i just think this is great i don't feel like i'm really missing out on anything like sometimes i think to myself i wonder what it would be like to be there but would i pay the hundreds of dollars to go and be crammed in a space feeling uncomfortable waiting for the bands to come on and yeah i don't know i think i think th i think this is what what it's like i think this is like getting old i think i think these are, these are <laughs> Because when I when I was in my twenties, it was like, a, yeah, it's a no brainer. This band's coming to to Sydney, then yeah, of course I'm gonna see them. But these days, it's just like, oh, I think my money might be better spent elsewhere on like <laughs> IKEA furniture or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that ties into our next topic around regular reviews. Because as we get older, we need to continue to reflect so that we we have records and we can be nostalgic about our earlier selves. I haven't actually gone back and read some of the blog posts I wrote when I was a 20 year old, but maybe that's something I should do one day. Let's talk about the type of reviews that we both do. I think you do more of it than I do. Do you want to talk about your review practice? Yeah. Well, well can I, like the question is, isn't, can I talk about it? The question is, can I stop really? <laughs> so uh, yeah, I think reviews is like one of the most powerful zero cost things you can do to make your life richer and uh it one of the things that, that comes to mind is so i i journal daily and i at the end of the week i basically i take a look at my journal and a few other things and i reflect on the things that happen and often what happens is there's these, there's these little things that come up where oh yeah, I forgot that I recorded that podcast with Jez on Friday. And I remember like talking about reviews. Oh, that's very meta, isn't it? But um, I, um, all these, all these things that are, are um, on, on their own, 
you might not might not look back on your year and and necessarily say, look, I remember recording that podcast episode with Jez on Friday, but by being able to revisit it, you actually replenish, I guess, the the richness of that of that event, and so you can you can yeah, it's almost like double dipping into the into the goodness of of, of highlights that happen during during the week, and so for the the really weekly noteworthy events, you can. Um, I also do a monthly, so I do a monthly review as well. So that basically takes all the weekly reviews and puts them together and draws out the themes. Also do that at a quarterly level and also a yearly level. And I think it's great because I'm not relying on my brain to to recall these things. And our brain, like our memory is just like so fallible. Uh, and so I'm, it's, it's just such a rich practice. And I, I think I've just started frothing at the mouth starting to talk about it. So um Jez, I'll um let why don't you why don't you tell us a little bit about about your practice as well? Hello there, this is Joey. I'm excited to tell you about a project I run where I help imaginative people just like you breathe life into their creative dreams, like writing that book or performing that stand-up comedy set. I know the first step can be daunting. I have been there many times and have helped many people on a similar journey. If you've wondered how to bring those ideas swimming around in your head to life, get in touch. We'll shrink the intimidating dragon of a goal into a cute little lizard of an achievable daily habit that you can do every day to get started and stay moving. Click on the link in the show description to get in touch. I try to do similar things. I I do daily journaling and I do have an end of week. Yeah, I've got... The, the weekly reflection is normally done with other people. I have a call every week on Friday mornings and another one on Sunday evenings where I check in with uh, some two groups of guys and we we report back. It's a bit of an accountability circle, but also an opportunity for me to reflect before I go into that meeting about what, I, what do I want to achieve in the next week. And I'll often report back on what were the, the wins, what were the challenges, and what was the highlight? That's definitely helpful. I think the the monthly and quarterly reviews, I haven't been doing them consistently. And it, it's something that I would like to do more of, because like you said, it's pretty hard to remember the specific details. And it's very easy for a year to wash by and to not really have anything that stands out. One thing that I was doing more last year and that I'd like to get back into was every week my wife and I would make a little Google slide where we would put photos from some of the things we did together in that week or if we didn't take a photo, some kind of pictorial representation of it so that we could go back and be intentionally nostalgic. I think you were touching on that as well of finding a a way to relive the experience so that it's not just a one-off that... I get to remember, oh, yeah, I did actually find that fun and I should do that again. Whereas it might otherwise be easy to neglect that sort of reflection. Yeah, 100%. I, I'm glad you brought up the, the Google slide idea or the, the video clip because I will also say that that is one of the richest, that that has been such a gold mine as well. So my practice is that at the end of the year, or for various trips that I take, I stitch like any videos or pictures together into like a little music video. And I, on Monday after, afternoon slash evening, I pick one at random to rewatch. And so I've been doing this since 2010 and I've got this huge library of goodness that I can just like pick out and, and go, oh yeah, in 2011, I was old. No, just kidding. In, in 2011, I I did this and I would have otherwise forgotten about it. It's like one of those things where looking back on your life, you probably wouldn't remember it. But um, yeah, by revisiting these videos, you, you realize that your life isn't like these big golden nuggets. It is actually made up for all these like little flecks of gold uh, stitched through it. And it's all about being aware of them and and um, savoring them. And I think reviews, whether they're written or what we're talking about now, which is the more audiovisual kind, it's 
it's one of those things that we're never really taught in school. I remember I used to have a journal when I was in school, but like everyone was like, oh, journaling. Um, but yeah. Was it a, I think it was a live journal? A, a live journal as in? LJ. I remember remember that being popular when I was in high school. Yeah, th- this this is where uh, differences in ages is, is going <laughs> to be going to be apparent. But no, it was just like a paper paper journal, and we just they, they'd say like write write about your day, and then you'd and it, you'd be in school as well, so like you'd always be afraid of people writing. I know people reading what you wrote and stuff like that, and going, "Oh, Joey likes so and so," and like so it's um. Yeah, but I think one of the one of one of the other things I'd recommend for anyone that wants to get started with it, I guess two things I'd recommend. One is keep it small. So in, in my last newsletter, I had sent out a, a takeaway. Uh one of the takeaways was if you want to get started with weekly reviews, you can think about your day and just write down one or two sentences that describe the day. And then on a Sunday or at some point in the week, just review all of your stories and and think about any things you'd like to remember. And then if you if you really want, want to um, derive the, the use out of it, um, sorry, if you really want to get the maximum benefit out of it, you can do that at a monthly level as well. So look at all the weekly stories and think about what stood out at a monthly level. And then when it comes to the annual review, you're not like stuck wondering what you did. Uh, and it's it's not, you're not limited to, the like really noteworthy big purchases you made or big like holidays you went on you'll have these little flecks of gold that um you you start to realize that your life is made up of and um so that that was one thing and then the other thing was oh yeah to try to keep it in a format that you know will be only for you uh so for example i i write all my pretty much all of my stuff is on things that are behind some kind of lock, whether that be a password or fingerprint or stuff. So I can be as candid, direct, blunt as I want to be because I I generally know no one is going to read it unless I get hacked. So it's, I think, I think that ability to be completely honest and transparent with yourself is, is one of the great things about journaling as well. Hmm. I actually tear mine up often after I write them in the morning. Because for me, it, it's mainly a means of processing emotions. And once I'm done with the writing, I don't feel like I need to keep a copy of it. Yeah, fair enough. But I do wonder about potentially more of a event log as well as the the state of emotions at that point. I might try and adopt that. I know a lot of people like doing bullet journaling. Where mm-hmm. is, is that similar to what you're talking about with just a few points each day and then collating that at the end of the week? Well, the thing about the bullet journal is that it it's it's not super simple. I compared to the process that I I was describing, with, which was just like one or two, one or two um, sentences, and and then and then revisiting that. Like the bullet journal has a whole methodology, and you know what you can you can take pieces that you want. You don't have to implement the whole thing. I uh, you can do that with any methodology. Uh, but yeah, when it, when I read the bullet journal, there's all these rules around. Like for example, uh, task list management as well. Like um, migrate everything across by hand and all these things. So um, and you don't need to. Yeah, you don't. You don't need to follow all of those rules. Um, but I guess when I when I looked at it, I think I I saw all the rules and I thought to myself, this is probably more like complicated than it needs to be. And I might have thrown the baby out with the bathwater in that respect. But yeah, do you do you have much success in implementing that, Jess? I haven't ever read the book. I've just seen people talk about it as a way of being very concise and time efficient because that might be the concern that all this reflection, doesn't it take time away from actually living life? How yeah, much time that's... does it take for you to do the daily journaling and the end of week reflection? Okay. I'm not a great, I'm not, I, I've been doing this for a while. So it's, um, and I, I really like the process. So it's, it's not, you can do this in a shorter amount of time. When I, when I started, um, I was essentially doing my weekly review on the couch in the 90 minutes that it took for an F1, F1 race to happen. So, cause I'd be watching the F1 race and I'd be doing, doing my review. Uh, that's, that's a weekly review. These days I'm at my desk. I'm really focused. 
and it can take me between um, three to four hours, but I have a lot more inputs that I'm that I'm tracking. Do I need all of them? Maybe not, but I it is it is like a, a pleasure thing for me as well. Like because I, I track a lot more things like my sleep and and my exercise, um, my personal best, uh, my like yeah, a whole bunch of different things, and that all these things that I track and I can reflect on it helps give my week it like this rich tapestry it it really feels like makes my my week feel rich and like what you were saying Jez with the idea of it takes time it it really gives a sense of slowing down the time as well because when I can reflect I don't ask myself geez that week went that week just rushed by me I don't even know what I did that process of reflecting allows me to come back and say oh yeah there were actually that that week was substantial and it didn't rush by me and so it's one of those things where and this was the subject of my newsletter it was like you gotta spend you gotta uh spend time to make time uh or you make time to spend time i think it can work either way but uh it's it's the idea of in, investing in uh investing your time rather than spending it um and so i think james clear said something which is like the idea of if you think about what you want to do in the next um, five minutes or five hours, you're probably spending your time. If you're thinking about what you want to do in the next five years, you're probably investing your time. And so I think being able to use your time in a way that's more uh, invest investment driven rather than spending driven is probably like one of the keys to, to um, yeah, feeling more time rich, I think. And it probably ties in as well to deliberate practice because that's part of your weekly review as well that you you think about what was what did I achieve during this time and could I have done it better and I, I think that's that right even though it, it takes time it probably makes you exponentially more efficient and effective over time because you keep on improving what you're doing in your work and in every aspect of your life yeah yeah so much Jess and I think I think this might be another clear quote or a Dr Seuss quote or a Stephen Covey wrote a, a Stephen Covey quote a, a, I'm not actually sure about the attribution, but it's that reading, reading someone else's stuff can teach you the best of what they know. Uh, but reflection can teach you the best of only what you can know. And so while other people's advice and expertise is good, it's not necessarily tailored to your context, the unique challenges that you're facing and, and what have you. Whereas um, I'm not saying like I'm saying you can still read other people's books and, and stuff, and they they definitely have their value it's it can be complemented though with all the all the wisdom and experience that you're gaining through living your life and then you start getting insights through the reviews and then you apply them and then you start learning more and like you said you've got that exponential learning function that happens and so that's why reviews are so amazing and i yeah i i love tell i love uh telling people about the the joys of it and how easy it is to get started. And I, I love that you you quote so much, James Clear, but you, your last statement is probably your justification why you, you won't read Atomic Habits. What's what's that? What was my what was my last statement again? Sorry. That it's better to reflect on your own life rather than reading. <laughs> and I can just blame James Clear for that. He just basically yeah. shot himself in the foot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think he got the best parts out of his writing. Oh, thank you. No, that, that's something that I, I'd like to do because I've felt, especially in the, the last couple of weeks, it really has rushed by and I haven't had enough intentionality and a, enough moments to to plan and to, to change course. I felt like my weeks have been so packed and I've had so many events scheduled in that it has been hard for me to actually course correct. And having that time, even though... It does involve a time investment. I think it will be worth it. I don't know that I'll, that I will do three to four hours, but I'd like to go back to at least half an hour. Right now, I'm, I'm, I'm sure doing I... about 15 minutes at the end of each week, and I think more time would be beneficial. There's a sweet spot. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to know. So first of all, I'm not sure if I'd recommend anyone do three to four hours. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm trying to, always looking for ways to streamline it um, to, to get, the most benefit from um 
the the time I spend. But like there is also a pleasure aspect to it as well. Like it, it can be intrinsically rewarding. Uh, but Jez, I, I'd like to understand a little bit more. Like you see, so you review 15 minutes at the end of the week. Why do you believe that you need to be doing more? Part of it is the getting things done approach where the weekly review from David Allen it involves what you're doing, but you probably also do task list management as well. That's right. And yep. getting to inbox zero clearing out the inbox. I think that's where I can see it taking more time. And that's not what I, that's what I'm not doing at the moment. And that's part of why I'm, I'm feeling like I begin the week on the back foot that I I haven't, Mm. I've got right now, I've got 65 flagged emails that I need to process. And I haven't actually got to inbox zero for quite some time because I've just been so packed for the last while that I'm, I'm really in firefighting react mode at the moment. And that is a bit of a symptom of, I was at a conference last week and I'm at a conference this weekend. I just haven't really had much time, but it's also a choice because I, I could make a decision that I would carve out a day next week where I won't do anything else. And I'm just going to catch up on everything that's been happening. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, I think also that, that idea of carving out time can be, can be, a little bit of a trap as well right because in for someone for someone as busy as you it's if you, if you could carve out the time then you probably would have already right so it's i think um and i'm not sure sorry jess i i assumed it was probably going to be like a like a period of a couple of hours or something like that but if, if you think about carving out a period of like 15 minutes or like five minutes or something then yeah that's that's something that i I'm I'm a big fan of like the if you if you find it difficult to make progress on something, just slice it up into small, unintimidating, harmless pieces and get get momentum like that. Yeah, that's true. It, the large block of time may be a fantasy. Yeah, I tend to find it's a it's a fantasy, except for when it comes to playing video games. For some reason, I can always manage to carve out a block of time. <laughs> Yeah, one thing I have done in the last couple of days is I've increased my my daily planning time from 10 minutes to 13 minutes. And I found that's been Good helpful one. in getting through the backlog of written notes that I have and the voice notes on my watch. I've been gradually crunching through them, but it still feels like more time would be beneficial. So I'm maybe you're right. Maybe it's just a, a case of trying to do a bit more each day. But I, I think having a set time either on a Sunday or a Monday would be beneficial for me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm a big fan as well of that, that incrementally, incrementally stepping up. Like for example, one of my goals for this quarter or what, what I found in my quarterly review was that I'm not really nurturing my creative side because I'm, I'm spending a lot of time trying to grow the business. So instead of trying to say like, okay, well, I'm just going to carve out an an hour on a Friday to to draw, I'm setting myself the very unambitious goal of draw for one minute every day. And so that has been so fun. And and because it's only one minute as well, the expectations are so low as well. So I can just like get in there and play and ultimately I'm drawing for longer than a minute, which is great. And um, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. The idea of like, because you increased your, you increase your time from 10 minutes to 13 minutes um, for that particular activity you're talking about. And a lot of people were just like, why not increase it to 15 minutes? But the thing is, it's just like, no, just make it, make it. I think there's something specific about like saying 11 minutes or 13 minutes or yeah. the prime numbers, I think maybe. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's um, I, it's a great idea, Jess. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I think it, I'm going to do that, but I'm also going to, find a way that I can, I reckon Mondays might be better for me. Sundays have felt, I keep on saying that I'll do it on Sunday and then Sundays get very full with social obligations, but Monday yep. mornings are normally a good time for me. So I'm going to cast something out in my calendar actually, and I will report <laughs> back coming. on how I go. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. I think that's a good point to wrap up the show. I hope that our dear listeners, I hope that you also make time for reflection that you avoid hyperbolic discounting, that you prioritize intrinsic motivation and that you find high quality information, including this podcast, but don't 
don't listen to it while you are washing the dishes or doing anything swimming. like that too often. Yeah, definitely not while swimming. That might be dangerous. <laughs> we'll catch you ne- next time. See ya. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Focus and Chill podcast. To listen to other episodes, jump onto podcast.focusbear.io. If you'd like to be a guest on the show or you know someone who'd be a good fit, email us at team at focusbear.io. Otherwise, stay focused, stay chilled, and peace out.